Uh, for those that don't know me, my name is Steve Flanders. I am a Senior Director of Engineering at Splunk, which was recently acquired by Cisco, so I'm not sure which one I'm supposed to say, uh, but I still call myself a Splunker. I've uh, been involved with the Open Census, which is kind of the precursor project to, to Open Symmetry. Uh, there was Open Census and Open Tracing, uh, and now Open Symmetry since the, the very beginning. I've uh, been involved in the observability space for over a decade now. I uh, was at VMware working on a logging product. I joined uh, as part of a founding team uh, at a company called Omniscient that Splunk acquired. It's now the Splunk APM product. Uh, and at Splunk, I've been responsible for the Splunk infrastructure monitoring product, which was the signal effects acquisition. Uh, so I've been working with traces, metrics, and logs uh, for a very long time. And then very recently, in fact, last week, I released a book called Mastering Open Symmetry and Observability. Uh, hopefully, you will uh, take a look at it. So let's start quick with a, a poll. I mean, I think at, we're at KubeCon, so I think there's going to be a lot of hands here. But how many people have heard of Open Symmetry? OK, great. How many people are using Open Symmetry? How many people are using Open Symmetry in production? Oh, wow, I love it. We've come a long way. Uh, so many people. In fact, earlier I was having some conversations with some folks that were talking about the collector, uh, which I thought was great, right? So I'm going to start with a little bit of basics. Uh, who has not used the Open, open Symmetry before? Anyone? There we go. Yeah, there's a few hands. That, that's expected. So uh, I'm going to start with a quick introduction of the project, but I'm going to spend most of my time today talking about one specific component, and that is called the collector. Uh, so let's start at a very high level. What is open telemetry? Basically, it is an open standard uh, that makes it possible to generate, collect, and process telemetry data. Uh, you might have heard of the three pillars of observability, traces, metrics, and logs. Open Symmetry provides a standard for that, but it supports even more than those three pillars, right? You have things like client instrumentation or profiling, synthetic data, and the like. Uh, so the project is really focused on all telemetry data that you would care about in your environment, whether that's within an application, maybe an end user device like a, a browser or a mobile device, uh, any language that you care about, all of that would be covered. But Open Symmetry does not provide a backend for that data. Instead, it is vendor agnostic and allows you to send that data wherever you want, whether that's an open source project, your own home-constructed uh, home home item, uh, or like a vendor, for example, cloud provider or some service provider or something to that extent. So very, very flexible. Now, how it does this is first it defines a standard that's called the specification. The specification basically defines the rules of like what must happen, what should happen, what could happen in terms of generating this telemetry data for any signal that it supports. Signal is the term that they use for this telemetry data. So a, a metric is a signal, trace is a signal, log is a signal. There's different types of them. Uh, and then the project enables like context and correlation across these different signal types. And there's a lot of value in that. Now, you may be wondering like, well, why does this matter? Why would you need a, a standard for this? Because prior, there wasn't one. And so basically any backend that you use would provide its own instrumentation. Uh, and that may or may not have the capabilities or the integrations that you care about. Uh, there's security aspects, operational concerns, and changing it, especially from a customer or end user perspective, was very, very difficult. Now you can instrument or add data collection components from OpenTelemetry, and you can use that across vendors, across open source tools that you have, uh, which makes it very, very powerful. So on top of this specification, there's basically two reference implementations. There are what are known as uh, instrumentation libraries. These actually go within your, your code itself. Uh, you can do that through things like automatic instrumentation or manual instrumentation. Uh, and then you have basically a collector component. You can think of it like an agent or a gateway or a pipeline uh, that basically exists that will receive this telemetry data, process it in some way, and then send it wherever you want it to go. Uh, I could spend all day just talking about the project. There's really a lot to it. But as I mentioned, I'm going to focus a lot on this data collection part today. Now, why does open telemetry matter? Well, first, kind of it has an open standard. That's great because now we have kind of one way of doing things, one kind of terminology that we can follow. Uh, but it also provides the ability of kind of being vendor agnostic. So you're no longer tied to a particular vendor when you're using uh, instrumentation or data collection pieces. Uh, this gives you kind of data portability and data control. You choose what to do with your telemetry data. You choose how much to generate. You choose where to send it. You have full control of it now. And that's very, very powerful. So if you want to have a data lake locally, if you want to run like open source tools within your environment, you can. If you want to send that to some like managed provider or a SaaS solution, you can. If you want to send them to both, like a local and, an, and a SaaS, you can. Uh, it's very, very powerful from an end user perspective to help you achieve observability. 
Now, of course, we're at KubeCon, so OpenSymmetry is part of the CNCF, uh, but it's actually a very active project. In fact, it's the second most active one in all of CNCF behind only Kubernetes. Uh, and this, I actually think, shows that it's a real problem that needs to be solved. And the community is great. It has a very large ecosystem, uh, and you see collaboration across vendors, cloud providers, and end users, which I think is amazing, right? Because working together, that's how you get the best observability uh, possibility at the end of the day. And what you will see is that basically every major vendor or cloud provider supports and contributes to OpenTelemetry today. Uh, and many end users have already either contributed or adopted it as well in their environments. Uh, and again, it's really for this flexibility that it provides. Now you can have one way of doing it, uh, and it supports other open standards that are out there, right? So it's meant to be flexible and extensible as the observability market kind of grows and evolves, so will the open symmetry project along with it. All right, so I mentioned most of this talk is on the collector, so that's it for kind of introductory information. What is the collector? Basically, it's a binary that exists that allows you to receive, process, and export data. Visually, kind of internally, it looks something like this. It's not a complete picture. It's kind of a simplification of it. Uh, but you have this notion of basically receiving data, kind of getting it into the collector. And there's different ways to do this. You can kind of use push or pull mechanisms. For example, if you're familiar with Prometheus, you would usually scrape an endpoint to get metric data. That would be kind of a pull mechanism versus if you've used distributed tracing before, it's often that the application will push the trace data to an agent or to an endpoint. That would be a push mechanism. Now, once you receive this data, you may actually want to do something with it. Just generating it may not be sufficient. For example, maybe you want to process it in some way. You want to filter what is actually sent to an endpoint. You want to redact sensitive information that might exist in there. Maybe you want to do some sort of aggregation or sampling or what have you. All of that happens within the internals of the collector itself. And then eventually you want to export it. You want to send it to some destination. The collector is usually not the final spot for it. Um, you could persist it to a disk if you wanted to, but that's not all that valuable because at the end of the day, you want to actually query that data. You want to get like dashboards and kind of visualizations or alerts from it. And again, OpenTelemetry doesn't provide a, a backend. Instead, it plugs into available backends that are in the market today. All right, now in terms of reference architectures, there's two primary ways to deploy the collector today. Uh, the modes are called agent mode, which basically means it runs as close to the application as possible. That might be a binary along with your application. That might be a sidecar, could be a daemon set in that it runs on like every single host in Kubernetes, for example. But basically it's very close to the app itself. The benefits of this mode are that you're basically offloading responsibility from the application as quickly as possible. You have it generate the telemetry data, but you don't have it do any of the processing. Now, the benefits of that are kind of twofold. One is you're not introducing additional load within your application that consumes more CPU, memory, kind of resources in general. And second, you can now have the, the collector, which is a single binary, handle all the processing in a generic way. Otherwise, you have to have those processing capabilities in every single language for, that you have in your environment, because the application instrumentation is going to be language specific at the end of the day. Uh, so there's some nuances to that in terms of configuration or even knowing like language specific uh, semantic conventions. Now, the other way that you can deploy the collector is as a gateway or, or as a service. This basically would sit in some sort of network boundary. Maybe this is like a data center or a region or a realm or whatever your terminology is. Uh, and in this mode, it's usually clustered. So you have more than one instance of the collector and you have usually a load balancer in front of it so you can support uh, a whole bunch of load coming in. In agent mode, you have one instance, it runs right alongside the application. Uh, so if you're doing like um, uh, a daemon set, you're gonna have one per host. You would not cluster it in that, in that way because it's using certain ports on that host. You would have port conflicts, it doesn't actually work. Uh, in gateway mode, you have to have a cluster of these or you usually have a cluster of these because you wanna have things like high availability uh, or maybe you're supporting a large number of applications or hosts in your environment. So just the pure scale of it requires more than one. In uh, both the agent and the collector can send data wherever you want it to, so you don't have to use like both here. You, don't, you can choose either one, and at the end of the day, everything in hotel is optional, so you can also choose not to use the collector. Uh, if you wanted to, you can actually have the application, the hotel library, for example, send directly to a backend if, if, that, is, uh, if that solves your business needs at the end of the day. Um, so really, flexibility and choice every step of the way, depending on your requirements. Uh, personally, I think the collector is a kind of a great component because it offloads a lot of responsibilities and kind of can get you into a, a vendor agnostic state a lot faster. Uh, you don't, don't even have to change your uh, application instrumentation. 
if you're already instrumented your apps, let's say it's not hotel-based, uh, as long as it's a format that the hotel collector can receive, it will handle all the translations for you. So you could receive in one format, let's say you receive in Prometheus format, and you can export in a different format. So if you want to send an OTLP, for example, which is Open Telemetry's protocol, all those translations happen within the collector automatically. That's what makes it vendor agnostic at the end of the day. Uh, now there's a couple specific things I want to drill into. This will become more relevant as we get into the, to the demo, but I mentioned it's a single binary. That binary is written in Go. Uh, it's a compiled language, so the good news is it supports like major operating systems, and you can just pull down that binary if you want to use it. There are other ways you could deploy as well. I mean, we're at KubeCon, right? I'm sure lots of you are using Docker containers or some sort of container engine. Uh, you may even be using Kubernetes. All of that is fully supported, right? OpenTelemetry is kind of born into the cloud native era, which is great. So it has native support for all these different environments. Uh, and there is packaging for this built into the, the OpenTelemetry community. So if you look at the documentation, you'll find that there's Docker images that you can readily pull down. Uh, and they are usually customized for what you're using. So in the case of like Kubernetes, what you'll see soon is that there's actually packaging where it only pulls in the components necessary to support Kubernetes. You could add more if you wanted to, uh, but the goal is like to, to give you native support for it easily. Uh, and again, everything is extensible, so if you want to write your own packaging, it's actually possible to do that as well. Now, there's one uh, notion in OpenTelemetry that you may have heard of. It's called distributions. Uh, OpenTelemetry natively has three, basically three primary types of distributions for the collector today. Uh, but anyone can have a distribution of open telemetry if they want to. That could be an end user, that could be a vendor, that could be another open source project. Um, so the project itself has three. Uh, they're typically called core, contrib, and Kubernetes, or Kates. Uh, core basically has the core capabilities that are required to use it with just pure uh, OTEL. So for example, I mentioned that open telemetry has its own protocol called OTLP. As a result, the collector has an OTLP receiver and an OTLP exporter because that's necessary for the project. That would be in the core repository, because it's core to the open telemetry project. Contrib is where everything that's not core to the project, or maybe is a little bit more nuanced, maybe it's only applicable to a subset of environments, it would live in contrib. So if you have something, let's say, I want to send data to uh, an endpoint like Zipkin or Jaeger, that's going to be in the contrib repository, because it's not core to open telemetry, but it is a capability that some amount of end users are going to care about and want at the end of the day. Uh, now, the, the reason why I'm mentioning core versus contrib is because that'll be necessary to actually configure the collector coming up. That's why I want to make sure to cover it. And the case of Kubernetes, again, as I mentioned, this just packages the ap applicable components, the receivers, processors, exporters, that you need to support a Kubernetes environment. Uh, now, there is a tool available called OCB, which allows you to build your own distribution. So if there are like certain components you want to pull out of contrib, you don't want every single component that exists in contrib, you only want a subset, you can actually build a manifest file and create your own distributions. And what you will see is that a lot of uh, cloud providers and vendors and open source projects have their own distributions too, right? So a distribution is not a fork. So if a distribution is done right, it's basically pulling in the open telemetry components that are necessary in order to support a specific environment. Most uh, vendors today have their own distribution. Usually they're only pulling in the components that are relevant to them. Maybe they have their own, for example, vendor-specific exporter. That would be in their distribution. If you're not using that vendor, you don't need that exporter. Um, many vendors are actually moving to the open telemetry format, so hopefully in the future it'll all just be na native OTLP, uh, but not all are there today. Uh, so that's one particular example. Or maybe there's some like specific thing that a vendor supports that's not applicable to other environments or what have you, maybe that could be in a distribution as well. Um, ideally, distributions should not be custom in that they contain things that are not eventually going to make it into the open telemetry project because that would be vendor lock-in again. Right? It doesn't actually uh, preclude the, the problem of, hey, I've instrumented once or I have one data collector and now I can collect everything. So ideally, it should be the same config that OTEL provides, uh, and it's possible maybe uh, some, some third party has developed something that they haven't been able to get upstream yet. Maybe they temporarily have that under distribution, but long term, everything within a distribution should be available in upstream. All right, so let's talk a little bit about open symmetry configuration. And I've mentioned several of these already, right? But there's basically five major components to the collector. Receivers, getting data in, processors, we talked about those, exporters, there's two more. Uh, so one is called extensions. These are usually things that do not touch the telemetry data themselves, but provide some sort of capability that you might want. 
So for example, if you wanna have like health check capabilities for the collector, that's an extension. Uh, but extensions can actually enrich things like receivers and exporters. Let's say I want to have some way of like authenticating a receiver or an exporter. That would live as an extension. Let's say I wanna have things like service discovery. That would be an extension. And so that extension could be called by a receiver or an exporter, but an extension itself doesn't typically touch the telemetry data. It provides some additional capabilities on top of it. And then the newest type of component is what's known as a connector. A connector is unique in that it is both a receiver and an exporter. Uh, and so what a connector does is uh, in open telemetry, you build what are called pipelines. So I define like receivers, how I get data in, uh, processors, what I wanna do with that data, exporters, how I get that data out. That would be a pipeline. I can have multiple of these pipelines. But after I run that flow, let's say I get to the exporter step, maybe I wanna reprocess it again. I wanna do something else with the data. That's where a connector comes in. So for example, let's say I process something and I get some metric out the other end that I care about and I wanna do something with that metric. I could create a connector that says, okay, I'm gonna export into the connector and I'm gonna reprocess it in a new receiver, which is the same connector, and I'm gonna do a different thing with that output at the end of the day. Um, so there's a bunch of different use cases for this, but it's a little bit more advanced. I'm not gonna to talk too much about it, but you should know that that is available components as well. How was the OTO collector configured? YAML, how many people like YAML? Oh wow, a lot. How many people don't like YAML? Yeah, I'm with all of you. I've never liked YAML. Uh, so everything's YAML based. If you're in Kubernetes, everything's YAML based. So I mean, you're gonna be very, very familiar with it at the end of the day. Uh, but the nice thing is if you understand the components and the structure of the collector, you kind of understand how the configuration of YAML works, right? So like every component I mentioned, that's a top level construct in the YAML config. You can see receivers here, right? You can see processors, exporters. Very, very simple. And then for every single receiver, a receiver has a name. For example, you can see a host metrics receiver here. And then every single component can have some amount of configuration. And of course, that is documented somewhere. So you need to go find that documentation. Uh, but then you, you specify the right amount of configuration for it, and that component will work. Now, there's a couple things to note about the collector configuration specifically. Uh, it's really a two-step process. So step one is you must define the components that you want to use and configure them the way that you want them to be configured. So if you want receivers, processors, exporters, you have to have a section for those and you must properly configure it. But just putting it in the config, just this top level that you can see highlighted here, that does not enable it. It has only defined it and configured it. To enable it, you must add it to a service pipeline. That's the second step. So you can see at the bottom here, it says service pipelines. Those pipelines are telemetry specific. So you can see metrics and traces listed here, but logs and other, other data types would also show up. And then for metrics, you can see it defines which receivers it's going to call. And clearly this receiver must support metrics, otherwise the config would fail. And then exporters, you have to specify the ones that you want. So configuration here is really a two-step process. If you only define it, uh, if you define it outside of a service pipeline, like let's say I had uh, this host metrics receiver up here, but it wasn't listed in any of these pipelines, it's kind of useless. It's not actually doing anything, it's just in the config. So note that you have to do kind of both parts. Now, how do I find all these configuration options? GitHub readme pages. So going back to this core versus contrib thing, let's say that I care about a specific uh, receiver config, I would have to know whether it's in the core repository or the contrib, here I'm in contrib. I'd have to go to whatever component I care about, here I'm in receivers, maybe you want processors or exporters, and then I'd have to go find the config or the component that I'm trying to configure. In that component, so here I'm looking at the OTLP receiver, there's a readme file, and that readme file has a configuration with YAML examples on what's required to get started and all the configuration options that exist there. So this is a great reference to make sure that you're configuring it properly at the end of the day. You will have to check to see if it's in core or contrib. Now, once you know the configuration, you have to specify that to the collector at the end of the day. Uh, the collector is a binary. So here you can see uh, multiple different examples. One is taking the OTEL call binary and passing a config flag, and I pass a YAML file. And you can actually pass more than one, and you can actually combine these. So it can get very complicated depending on how you wanna do this. Uh, those config files could be statically defined or dynamically generated. For example, you can pass environmental variables into the YAML file if you want to. Uh, and there is something in OpenSymmetry that makes it a little bit more SQL-like. Uh, it's called the OpenSymmetry Transformation Language, or OTTL. Uh, and this is another way of specifying configuration. 
Uh, a lot of OTTL is still in the alpha state, so I'm not gonna talk too much about it, but I do think it's a very cool project and something to take a look at. And I think in the future, many of the processors, if not the entire OTTL config, will be based on OTTL. So stay tuned for more information regarding that. All right, so let's do a quick demo on how to kind of get this working uh, for an environment. So I have downloaded the binary to my system. I'm on uh, an OSX system here. So I have Darwin ARM64, and uh, in here it basically just has the uh, contrib repository. So I'm not using core, I'm using contrib because it has a lot more cool components. And so if I just want to run this, I would just say start the, the binary, right? now. It's not going to work, because by default, there is no config that I specify to it, so it doesn't start. It basically says you need to provide a configuration. So uh, let's go ahead and build something. So as I mentioned, we have to have components that we care about. So I'm gonna want receivers. I can say OTLP, again, open telemetry protocol, and I can say host metrics. Let's use that as an example. And host metrics has this notion of scrapers. Scrapers are things like CPU, memory, disk, things that I care about and let's say I want to enable the memory scraper. So very, very basic configuration here. And then I will define exporters, and to make it very, very simple, uh, I'm gonna use the debug exporter, which basically logs the output to the console. Uh, so I'm not actually sending it anywhere specific, but of course you could send this to Jaeger, or Prometheus, or Elastic, or whatever you care about, any backend. Uh, all those configurations are gonna be kind of specific to your environment. Now, all I need to specify is receivers and exporters. Processors are technically optional, so this is a valid config at the end of the day, but I have only uh, defined them and configured them. I still have to build my service pipelines, uh, and so here, let's say I wanna have a metrics one, and I have to, again, define the order in which I want these to happen. So I'm gonna say, let's enable the host metrics receiver, and let's uh, send that data to the debug exporter. So, I mean, very, very basic config at the, at the end of the day here. I'm not actually doing anything with the data, I'm just taking it in and I'm sending it back out on the other end. Now, uh, first question might be, is this config valid? Answer is actually no, but um, you don't know when you're typing in YAML, but it turns out that OpenSymmetry has this validate uh, command, which is pretty cool. So basically, it will validate the config file that you have uh, and make sure that it is actually uh, containing what you what you need. So here it's gonna come back and say, this is not valid, right? I, I looked at this and the, it says that the exporter uh, is an invalid key for the service pipeline metrics. Okay, so that's because it's exporters, plural, matters here. I have a syntax error. Now, the reason why I'm showing you this validate command is because I don't see a lot of people use it. Uh, if you were to push this to production and you don't run the validate command, the collector didn't start as you saw, right? That means it crashed. Well, let's say that you had a working collector config, you made a modification, you pushed that to production, you don't run the validate command, you would bring down the collector and you'd start losing telemetry data. It's not great, right? So you should always validate before you actually deploy this, otherwise you'll run into problems. Okay, so we fixed the first typo, now it's saying, hey, there's something wrong with the OTLP receiver, right? It says that it needs to specify some sort of protocol. Well, maybe it's my first time using uh, the OTLP receiver, so I know nothing about it. So let's go ahead and go find the uh, open telemetry receiver. So I'm in the core repository, receivers, OTLP. There's a readme. It says, well, if you define an OTLP receiver, you must define protocols, and you can choose gRPC or HTTP or both. Well, I didn't do that. So again, I have an invalid configuration. So if things are not working on your collector, go check the readme files. They're very, very helpful. Uh, if you see a documentation problem in the readme, please file an issue or submit a, a PR to kind of fix it. Uh, but the readme file is a great way to see if you're doing things correctly. So I can say protocols here, and I could say protocols, and I could say something like HTTP. And now let's run it one more time and see if we are valid, and no error this time. Great, I at least have a valid config. Now, it's valid, but remember, I have OTLP defined here. I didn't define it in a pipeline. OTLP is not actually being enabled, so it's kind of useless, but it is a valid config. Like the collector will start, it's not gonna crash on me. Uh, so we have kind of our first step. So let's go ahead and run this. I can say run it with the config file, and now it will start. And it is actually logging information that is very, very relevant. For example, it tells you what is actually being configured in these info messages. And if something was wrong, it would actually show warnings and errors in the logs. So I highly recommend that you look at the logs as well. This is a great way to see if things are working as you expect at the end of the day. Now, the most important line is actually this last one, 
which basically says, hey, I actually collected some metrics and uh, three data points actually, and I sent it to the debug exporter. Now you can't actually see that here because it's not being, it's just being summarized as to what's being generated. Let's make this a little bit easier to, to see. So we can say uh, verbosity debug and just rerun this. And then, oop, uh, unknown metrics, verbosity, oh, details. Yes, my bad, details. See, this is why you need to go check the config. Uh, there we go. And so now that summarized line becomes an actual output that I can read. So I configured the metric scraper for memory, and you can see it created some metrics for me, used, free, and inactive, and you can see the value of those data points as well. So if I were to send this to Prometheus, it should receive this data, or if I expose the Prometheus endpoint, it could be scraped by a Prometheus server. So again, very easy to get started. But this is pretty basic, right? Like no one's probably gonna have just one receiver, one exporter. At the very least, you're gonna have processors. So let's talk about processors because they're kind of uh, important and unique here. So first, there's something known as the batch processor. And second, there's one called the memory limiter. Uh, I'm gonna call these out explicitly because uh, it's a little bit buried in the documentation. If you look, you go to the collect, I'm open telemetry IO docs collector. If you go to the configuration, it will tell you how to like configure. So you can see passing the config flag, it's showing you different ways of passing environmental variables. It tells you about receivers, processors, and exporters. We can go to processors, and there's a link here that says processors are optional, although some are recommended. Well, that's interesting, let's click that. And it tells you actually that you should have the memory limiter first and the batch close to the end and some other specific ones in between. Well, you have to manually configure this. So if you didn't read the documentation, you might not be aware of this, but by default, OpenSymmetry doesn't batch. So every single like, telemetry thing that's being generated will just export immediately. Well, at scale, that's not ideal. You kind of want to batch this stuff up. It compresses very, very well. You want to resource, uh, limit some of the resource use or network connections that you're making. The memory limiter is actually also very important. If you don't configure the memory limiter, then the collector can eventually consume all the memory and then crash because it's out of memory. So setting the limiter in place is very important for production environments. Otherwise, again, the collector could be in some sort of crash loop state and you'll be dropping telemetry data. So I highly recommend configuring both. Uh, the batch processor actually has a default config that's pretty sane, so you don't typically have to specify more options. Um, in the case of the memory limiter, you have to specify how often you want it to check, maybe like five seconds, uh, and you need to specify at least some sort of limit. So I'm gonna specify like a 400 megabyte limit. And then, again, that's only defined it and configured it. If I want it to actually be enabled, I have to put it into a pipeline. So I would have to say memory limiter, because it recommends putting that first, and then batch. So that actually brings up another excellent point, which is processors, that list is executed in the order in which you define it. So the memory limiter is being run first, the batch processor is being run second. If I switch the order, it happens in this, the different order. So the processors are the only ones with the order that you define it in the configuration matter. It's not true for receivers or exporters, it's only true for processors, uh, so keep that in mind. So, okay, did that. Uh, first step should be validate the config. Let's make sure it's actually valid. There are no errors, great. Then I can just rerun it. And this is the exact same test. I didn't actually change the telemetry data, so the output's gonna be the same other than the values and the timestamps have changed, but like it's behaving the exact same way. But now I have a more production-like config. I'm configuring things that are recommended by the OpenTelemetry project. One final thing, let's add one more that's actually a little bit more interesting. I'm gonna add the resource detector uh, I'm gonna probably forget the config here, uh, detectors and system. So this is going to check the system uh, and attempt to add more metadata. I hope it is called resource detector. I'm gonna find out in a second. Uh, and I wanna add it between these two. So resource detector and let's see how I did in terms of configuration. Nope, uh, resource detector processors, what's it called? I forgot. What is it? Detector one, yeah. Resource detect, oh, oh, thank you. Oh, it's just a typo, thanks. It's pretty close, still doesn't like me. Resource detector, thank you, thank you. Resource detection, so close, it's been a long day. No underscore, 
Really? No, not no run score? Okay. I tested this before and I've already forgotten, so this is why checking the documentation is important. And, hey, thanks folks. Uh, config. So, this is only going to do one thing. It's going to still generate the used, free, and inactive. But if you scroll up, you're actually going to see that it now contains some more metadata that it didn't contain any before. That metadata is the host name and the OS type of my system. Now, the resource detection processor can do a lot more than this. It's a very basic example. Uh, and it can hook into things like Kubernetes or your Docker uh, daemon set or anything like that and collect that metadata too. Um, but this is enriching the telemetry data. And honestly, this is very important because that's how you do problem isolation and kind of root cause detection at the end of the day. You want to know why memory is high or where exactly in your environment is happening. That's where things like resource detection can be helpful. Uh, now, a final example would be like showing you how to do like CRUD metadata operations, create, remove, update, delete type things. Uh, you can do that to any of the metadata that's attached here. For example, if there was some like personally identifying information or something that you didn't want to like send to a backend to an exporter, you could actually redact that information or hash it. Uh, if you wanted to enrich this from the collector, let's say I want to add a tag for everything that comes through the collector, you can do that as well through processors. Uh, so again, pretty easy to get uh, started, but you have to know that syntax, and even I made a mistake here live, right? Like, you have to check the readmes for this. The Otel documentation, I think, is pretty rich, so definitely take a look. They have different examples to kind of get you started, but all those receivers, processors, exporters, they're in the GitHub repo today. Uh, they are not fully up on the, on the doc site. Hopefully that will be fixed at some point here very, very soon. Okay, so uh, wrapping up here. I have a link to kind of everything that I kind of showed here, so you can kind of review this afterwards. I'll share the links on the, on the schedule site so you can kind of see it. And then finally, uh, thanks so much. Hopefully you found this kind of useful. Uh, hopefully you'll take a look at the book. I actually have a few copies. So we can do that for like people who have questions. Uh, and there is a promo code if, for people that go to KubeCon if you're interested. So thank you very much. And I have a couple. Couple minutes for questions. If you could use the microphones, it would be great. Hello. Hey. Um, so from the some of the other talks that we heard is like, if you want to get metrics at the full resolution while sampling traces, we need to run a layered collector. Is that what you would recommend? Where we need to run like collector in multiple layers if you want to. Preserve metrics while just sampling traces. So, so you're sampling traces, but you want all the metrics. Is that correct? Yeah, with 100% yeah. fidelity. Yeah, yeah. So there, there is a connector for this that will give you the, the, the red metrics out of the, the data. Uh, and then if you're using something like tail sampling, you'll have to use like a, a routing. You, you have to route the, every single trace, within, every span within the same trace, the same collector instance. So if you're using the uh, collector in agent mode, it actually has a way of routing to the, the dynamically based on the trace ID to the same instance. So you have to enable that in agent mode. And then within the collector, you have to enable the connector that would actually do the metrics for you. If you wanted to, you could separate the metrics and the traces into different collector clusters. Um, that's really only necessary at high scale or if you really care about one telemetry type over the other and you don't want to have noisy neighbor problems. Uh, for simplicity's sake, I would say doing it in the same collector instance is probably fine for most use cases, uh, but at massive scale or for some corner cases, you may need to break that out. Thanks. Yes. So, a uh, stupid question. Uh, is there any uh, is there any ways to debug uh, the like processor's logic other than like uh, using the debug exporter? Uh, so, what I faced was like when I tried to configure uh, trace to spam matrix uh, a connector, uh, I wrote the completely like incorrect OTTL and didn't export anything. And so needed to figure out and I couldn't figure out why it's wrong by just checking the like, uh, debug exporters. Yep. So, yeah, yeah. yeah, so you're asking like, hey, I want to make sure this thing is working properly. How do I see more of the internals? It depends on which part you care about. Uh, so for example, if you care more about like how the pipelines are constructed, there's a Z pages extension and it'll actually show you the pipelines live. Uh, there's actually a CLI wide way to actually see the pipeline too to make sure it's like looking the way that you think that it is. Um, there are even sites like hotelbin.io where you can take a uh, YAML file and upload it and it will visually show you what your configuration looks like. 
Uh, so if that's your problem, there are ways to do it. But if it is like, hey, I've configured it a certain way and I'm not seeing the output that I expect, or like the data is being dropped somewhere, the deb debug exporter is one of the easiest ways, I'd say. Um, there was another one, I'm not sure if it's still there, called the tap exporter. And there was a way of tapping a pipeline to see data between it. I'm not sure if that's still there, uh, but personally, I use the debug exporter often when I'm having uh, issues like that. Got it, thank you. Yep, go ahead. Hi, I have a uh, question about uh, large-scale use cases of open telemetry. Oftentimes, it's adv advised in monitoring systems to push aggregations to the edge as much as possible. Yep. Um, are there either any stateful or stateless aggregation capabilities currently in the collector, and yep. are there plans to add those sorts of capabilities in the future? Yep. Yeah, uh, so we were actually having this, some of this conversation earlier. So I talked a lot about the YAML config of the collector, but not necessarily the operational aspects of it. Uh, in general, my recommendation would be if you can run the collector stateless, it's in your best interest. <laughs> it's way easier. You can just add another instance behind the load balancer. It scales linearly. Life is good. But of course, there are use cases where that's not possible. If you're doing tail-based sampling, it's really not possible because you have to make sure all the spans for a trace end up on the same collector instance. That's stateful at the end of the day. Uh, there are stateful aspects of the collector. For example, there's, a, there's storage uh, exporters that you can configure uh, or processors that you can configure, and those are stateful at the end of the day. So one use case might be, I want to make sure that I don't drop telemetry data. So if the collector like restarts or something, I need to retry that data, you could use the storage extension here to like store that data locally and have it basically checkpoint, pick it back up when the collector comes back online and then export it back out. You were talking about aggregation. There are aggregation use cases where that's also necessary at the end of the day. If you're doing like histogram or certain like dynamic things where you wanna aggregate things up before you send it out. Um, where possible, I would say do it in memory because if you lose it, it's probably not the end of the world. Uh, but for some use cases like logs or like compliant environments, losing that data is a compliance violation. You would have to use something stateful in the collector uh, to make it work. But yes, there are definitely stateful aspects that you can configure. If you can avoid it, I would say avoid it. If you think something is missing, please file an, an enhancement request and just say, hey, I need this capability. The community is very, very active and can definitely help you with that as well. Yes. Hi. Uh, yeah, this isn't really a configuration question per se, but just kind of the rationale behind using Otel versus other tooling. Um, yeah. My company, we're already using FluentBit and Prometheus to get logs and metrics from everything. Yeah. Um, we've had some internal meetings about whether to start using Otel, yeah. um, but it, it's kind of confusing talking to some of the senior devs trying to figure out why yeah. adding one more tool to what we're already doing or, yeah. or what would be the advantages of Otel over um, yeah. some of the other stuff we're already using. So look, if, if what you have is working and it meets your business requirements, there's no reason to change, right? So if you're happy with FluentBit and Prometheus, fine, no problem, right? So it depends, I would say, on what are your use cases and what are you trying to solve for? One use case that Otel can help with is being vendor agnostic. So let's say you want to switch off of Prometheus, or for whatever reason you want to switch off of Fluent Bit. If you have Otel, you can now point it to something else if you wanted to. Don't have that requirements? Don't change, right? It's fine. <laughs> uh, so it really comes down to what are you trying to solve? I would say if you're using a vendor's proprietary instrumentation or data collection, there's a lot of value to moving to something like Otel, because now you're not locked into that vendor. If you want to send the data somewhere else, you easily can. If you want to switch vendors, you can easily do it. You're talking about open source tooling. Otel supports Fluent Bits, like they, they natively integrate. You can have Fluent Bits sent to the collector if you want. So like there's no need to replace what's already working in your environments. If there's some value you get out of Otel that you might not be getting from Fluent Bits, maybe that could be a reason for you. If that's not the case, keep going. You're already using open source tooling. So I don't wanna get into like a religious war on which open source tool to work. They're all great, right? Like if it's meeting your use cases and you're not locked into a vendor solution, maybe there's not a lot of value being provided. Thanks. Thanks. We're at time, so uh, I'm happy to take additional questions. I can follow people out, but I think I'm going to get kicked out. So thank you so much. <laughs>